Welcome back. I'm Ian Masters, and this is Background Briefing, available 24-7 at backgroundbriefing.org. And joining us now are Donald Cohen, the founder and executive director of In the Public Interest, an Oakland, California-based national resource and policy center on privatization and responsible contracting. He's also a founding board member of the Partnership for Working Families and a former political director of the San Diego and Imperial Counties Labor Council. His writing has appeared in the New York Times, Reuters, Los Angeles Times, and the New Republic, and he is the co-author of the new book, The Privatization of Everything, How the Plunder of Public Goods Transformed America and How We Can Fight Back. Welcome to Background Briefing, Donald Cohen. Thanks so much for having me. I look forward to the discussion. Well, thanks for joining us, Donald. And obviously, the plutocracy is on a roll in, the, in America. There's a new phenomenon now in political science known as plutocratic populism, which Trump exemplifies since he's, all of his policies ultimately reward the plutocrats, but his followers, his base, are all these populists. So given that massive voter suppression is underway and the Republicans could well create a one-party state starting in the end of the year with the elections uh, this year, it would seem to me that some of the stuff that you have in your book about our recent history, particularly going back over 100 years ago to the last quarter of the 19th century, where the wealthy residents of New York and Chicago and Cleveland constructed armories in the middle of their wealthy enclaves with billionaires or millionaires what paying for it and the military manning them. New York's new armory on the Upper East Side was funded largely by the head fundraiser William Astor. There was a, a library, a mahogany library, called the Veterans Room that was designed by Louis Comfort Tiffany. So... The whole purpose of that was that the plutocrats were afraid that the masses would rise up. Well, similar legislation is happening in this country, and particularly in the, some of the states, like DeSantis's Florida. They're mm-hmm. anticipating the Democrats and those that were denied the vote in November and those who had the vote stolen in November that they might rise up. DeSantis has passed laws in Florida which prevent people from demonstrating, more than five or six people gathering. And in fact, if you are a Trumpster or a member of a militia and a supporter of Trump or a MAGA-hatted person, you can drive your pickup truck into a crowd of Democrats and get get an out-of-free jail pass. So there seems to be some similarities here, wouldn't you say? Uh, yeah, there were definitely similarities. That's uh, quite a opening to sort of think about. So, uh, yes, there are enormous similarities. And it's not just the, you know, the, the populists, as you say, it is the, the plutocrats who are benefiting from this, who, in you know, in many ways are funding it. I mean, not all of them, but, you know, the Koch brothers are funding lots of some of this, you know, anti-CRT and, anti, you know, populist stuff on the right, on the, in the grassroots right, if you can call it that. Um, so they are taking advantage, you know, in the end, you know, the book, the, the book talks about sort of the, basically the corporate assault on democracy by getting control of our public things. And they are using racism and they are using, you know, right wing populism to, you know, to turn people away from public services, to turn people away from government so that they can get their hands on it. It's a real, you know, it's just kind of a simple story. And, and you know, I think the other thing is when you, when you sort of describe that arc of history, you know, there, you know, this may not be entirely accurate, but there was a period of time, you know, in the middle of the century, 21st, 20th century, excuse me, when corporate America saw their interests tied to the interest of the rest of us because we were their consumers. That's less true now. They can be, you know, they, they they operate globally. We operate domestically. So I think we're seeing that same sort of, you know, global gated communities happen, um, you know, in, in in global you know markets and capitalism now. Well, there's always been these characters like Grover Norquist, who said that his aim is to shrink government down enough so you can drown it in the bathtub, uh, and he's always been funded by plutocrats. But you mentioned the Koch brothers. The more insidious plutocrat out there now that's funding the most rabid MAGA candidates for the U.S. Senate, including J.D. Vance in Ohio, is Peter Thiel. Yep. And the richest 10 people in the world, I think eight out of 10 of them, are from Silicon Valley. 
and they're certainly not all funding Trump, although Zuckerberg arguably is helping Trump enormously by the laissez-faire nature of Facebook, meaning that the far right and the neo-Nazis can organize on Facebook, which they do. Mm -hmm. So I see him as being really a danger. And basically, by running these rabid far-right candidates who want to destroy government, that seems to be what's happening. I mean, I just read a piece this morning on the BBC, uh, Donald, basically saying, is America ungovernable? Well, <laughs> the plutocrats and the libertarian plutocrats like Peter Thiel want it to be ungovernable. Isn't that their very aim? Yeah, it's pretty simple. You know, they, you know, I mean, I think I don't know Peter Thiel personally, but he is a, you know, a self-interested uh, libertarian is how I would call him. He is he probably is a true believer in libertarian, you know, be, with libertarian beliefs, but he conveniently makes lots of money <laughs> with those set of beliefs. So that's why, you know, that's why I put them together. So what do they want? They want fewer regulations. They want fewer taxes. They want fewer unions. They want fewer obstacles and restrictions on their ability to make money and to do what they want. I, you know, I, I think it's as simple as that. And government gets in the way. Now, occasionally government subsidizes things, but they, you know, there are lots of there's lots of hypocrisy in that by you know corporations, probably even Thiel. But, you know, because they they benefit massively from government spending and subsidies and, and all sorts of things. But, you know, they just, you know, hypocrisy hasn't been a problem recently, you know, by conservatives. And again, I'm speaking with Donald Cohen, who's the founder and executive director of In the Public Interest, an Oakland, California-based national resource and policy center on privatization and responsible contracting. He's also a founding board member of the Partnership for Working Families and a former political director of the San Diego and Imperial Counties Labor Council. And his latest book, co-authored with Alan Milikalian, is The Privatization of Everything, How the plunder of public goods transformed America and how we can fight back. So the Build Back Better plan is dead. We saw yesterday in the Senate this somewhat futile debate to rescue voting rights from this Republican assault with Mansion and Cinema basically killing it. And that's obviously hugely damaging. But Mansion and Cinema were able to get their infrastructure bill passed. Uh, at the expense of Build Back Better. And much of that infrastructure bill, which I think, what, 20-odd Republicans joined it for a very good reason, that it was essentially a Republican bill. And one of the aspects of it, of course, was broadband. And here we are, the country that invented the Internet with some of the worst broadband in the world. It's taken for granted in Japan, South Korea, France, other countries. You get a whole gigabyte, and it's very cheap. Now, a few, few munis municipalities in the United States have managed to get a gigabyte broadband like Chattanooga, Tennessee and Santa Monica, California here. But in the bipartisan infrastructure bill that Mansion and Cinema were touting and celebrating, the telecom monopolies, Verizon and AT&T, etc., they ran the table. They got everything. Government money is going to subsidize their crappy service. Yeah, that's right. I mean, and you, you know, that's. I mean, listen, it's about power. It's about who controls our stuff. It's about who gets who benefits from it. It's about who pays for it. it. You know, when you get down to it, the other interesting thing about broadband is, you know, and, and sort of to show the power of the telecoms, is a number of cities, like you mentioned, Chattanooga and and others around the country, have said, let's do, you know, municipal broadband. Let's have public broadband in our communities, and for you know, it'll be cheaper, and we can and we can do like, you know, what Chattanooga did. We can have better. So what? But the the telecom response, telecom companies' response was to go to state legislatures and and get laws passed to prevent and prohibit cities from being able to do that. Um, you know, preemption bills they're referred to as the you know sort of the interesting twist on that to sort of show a little that gives me a little bit of hope is that the Colorado law allowed cities if they wanted to do municipal broadband they could, they would have to take a public vote. Um, and everyone that that did that did the, it was was passed overwhelmingly. Denver, Loveland. I mean, there's a, a long list of cities because people understand, you know, when they're being taken. Well, but they don't have a choice in, more often than not. And those preemptive laws, by the way, are in that bipartisan bill that is now law. And 
yeah. I don't know how, how you stop that because I need good broadband to do my program now from home studios because of COVID. And uh, it's pathetic. Uh, well, I mean, it's pretty clear that it's pretty clear to all of us now, or many of us, that broadband access to the internet is as important as the interstate highway system, as our transit systems, as our mobility. It's you know, it's that fundamentally essential in piece of our infrastructure. You know, the the rural broadband issue is a, is very problematic. You know, I I was in Northern California for a month last year. Um, you know, in COVID. All we had was satellite broadband. Couldn't use it. Couldn't you? Couldn't do business. You know, couldn't have meetings. Couldn't do things. And you know, so people who genuinely live in small towns and rural communities across the country don't have the same access, even that we do in the city. With you know, and I, I buy it from Spectrum. Um, but you know, that's a problem for the economy overall. It's a problem for lots of people's lives and farmers and sort of all of the above. You know, that's the you know the first thing we got to decide is is it. Uh, an essential piece, essential public good that we all need. Yes. How do we, and then how do we make sure everyone's got it? How do we make sure we're not being gouged, you know, by private companies? Um, that's the government's role and only the, and, and government, you know, federal government and state governments are the only institutions that can accomplish that. Well, of course, the other canard that's foisted along with this idea of, of going back to Reagan that government is the problem as opposed to the solution and that's that has metastasized but now you have a situation where all the republicans can say is that biden's a socialist and that anybody in the democratic party is now a leftist which is pathetically untrue of course uh, biden was confronted with that yesterday in his press conference so can you make a, an argument a a pro-capitalist argument now to neutralize these lies and nonsense. In other words, that with more public competition for broadband and, for example, Biden mentioned in his speech how one of the big drivers of inflation along with rising gas prices are the four monopolies that control the meatpacking in, in terms of beef and pork and poultry. Uh, one of them is a Brazilian company, the other one is Chinese-owned, that Biden's talking about getting more competition going. So is that an argument that could work? It, because obviously this is a deeply capitalist country and and mm -hmm. hostility towards anything on the left is manifest, of course, and to the point of absurdity. Well, well I, I'm not an expert in monopoly in, on monopolies, but I do work with a number of people who are, and um, I think... You know, I genuinely believe that the concentration of economic power in the market and in politics, of course, it, you know, hurts us all. So I think that's, you know, that's the first thing, important thing I'd say. But having but just, you know, again, this is not from a position of expertise, but just breaking things up doesn't only without a, another step or two doesn't necessarily, you know, take us all the way. And the, the other the first and other step is to make sure we set standards. Right. Right. So it's not the free market. Let everybody go. Let's break up the big ones. And then then it becomes a race, you know, continues as a race to the bottom. We need to make sure we do that. We 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 appropriately insert competition so to help consumers, but not hurt workers. All right. And communities in other ways. Um, so I, I think that's kind of really important to understand. But, the, you know, I, again, at the core of a lot we're facing now is the concentration of power and wealth and, 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 and you know, across the board. The other thing I'll say in terms of, you know, you asked about a pro-capitalist argument. One of the things I talk about a lot is, you know, there are um, businesses do one thing. They sell stuff. That's it. That's all they do. They want to sell more and they want to make more. And, you know, it's it's what they do. I'm not, you know, purely objectively. But that's not always in our interest. You know, prison companies sell heads and beds. We want fewer people in beds. So they, you know, they use their power, economic power and political power you know, to put more heads in beds, more people in prison and immigrant detention centers. So, you know, I think that's really important to understand that we have different interests there. I'll just say their interests are legitimate businesses. That's what they do. I mean, I don't think so in private prisons, actually, but, in you know, just in general. Um, but they're different. There's public things and there's market things and there's private things and they don't match. They don't mix. We don't you can't uh, you can't accomplish what we need to do for everybody. The essentials if you give it to the market and you give it to private sector. So you have to, you know, the first thing is you've got to get clear about the difference of our interests. 
Right. Well, at the end of the day, are you going to confiscate and privatise the air we breathe? We're, they're already privatising the water we drink. It's, That's right. Well, the oil company, I mean, listen, they've, yes, they've privatised the air we breathe because here's how we define privatisation. Private control over public goods. Public goods broadly defined that we all need clean air, a healthy environment, clean water, the planet. I mean, all of the above. Right now, the oil companies have more control over the, you know, the, uh, the quality of our air and, and, and the amount of greenhouse gases than we do. That's control. That's privatization, in my view. Sure. And, it's, and, it's, and it's, you know, it's putting and the And they're fighting uh, uh, efforts to uh, deal with global warming. Well, that's right, because, again, it goes back to what I was saying earlier. They do one thing. They sell stuff. They sell oil. And so all they care about, you know, really is how much oil can they sell? How much can they, the cost to make? Meaning, you know, fewer reg regulations helps keep, keep the cost down. Uh, what's their market share? And what's the, you know, what's the profit margin? That's what they care about. Um, and it's our job to make sure that their interests don't supersede ours. Well, Donald Cole, I thank you very much for joining us here today. I appreciate it. Yeah, and I thank you as well. I enjoyed the conversation. And again, I've been speaking with Donald Cohen, who's the founder and executive director of In the Public Interest, an Oakland, California-based national resource and policy center on privatization and responsible contracting. He's also a founding board member of the Partnership for Working Families and a former political director of the San Diego and Imperial Counties Labor Council. And he's a co-author with Alan McKellian of a new book, The Privatization of Everything, How the Plunder of Public Goods Transformed America and How We Can Fight Back. This has been Background Briefing. I'm Ian Masters, and I'd like to thank producer Graham Fitzgibbon. And to help us sustain this program into the future and assure it remains free to all, please take a moment to support us by going to backgroundbriefing.org slash donate or publictruthmedia.org, where you will find our nonprofit Public Truth Media Foundation, where your tax-deductible donations, large and small, keep us broadcasting. And if you missed any of today's program and would like to explore our vast archives, you can find us at backgroundbriefing.org, where we'll include extended interviews searchable by topic and have made it easy for you to sign up for daily email updates that provide links to resources, articles, and books discussed on the program. Also, you can find links there to subscribe wherever you get your podcasts, and we also encourage your ratings and reviews on these platforms. Find us on Twitter and Facebook at Ian Masters Media. And please do help us reach more listeners by sharing this program with friends, family, and colleagues. And I'll be back again on Sunday with another background briefing at backgroundbriefing.org. Bye for now. The guy that lived next door in 305 Took the kids to the park and disappeared by half past nine One more light goes on in the